It's a great honor for me to be here today to join the Women's Refugee Commission Voices of Courage Awards Luncheon to celebrate these exemplary leaders of refugee women and children, these people whose bravery is humbling, inspiring, galvanizing. I want to tell you that when I was a little girl, I lived in New Jersey, over there. <laughs> And I remember going to my friend's house, and um, there was a sampler up on the wall of the kitchen, right over the stove where her mother often stood. And it was a cartoon of a man walking with a briefcase and a woman at the stove. And the adage said, man works from sun to sun. Women's work is never done. And I remember, I remember being very, puzzling over this and thinking about it as a little girl and thinking, well, that's really true because my father goes off when the sun comes up and he comes back at night and he takes his paper and sits down and he's served dinner and after dinner my mother cleans up the kitchen and she oversees homework and she bathes us and puts us to bed and I thought, he has the job that finishes, and hers is never done, even on weekends. And I, it was an early lesson in the work of the Women's Commission, because the Women's Commission's work never is done. They operate on a mother's clock, 24 hours, <laughs> seven days a week, all year long. Because the global need never slows, sadly. It only grows, and so must our determination to serve it. The work of the Women's Refugee Commission is critical, not only because they serve the most vulnerable, but because they know with, that with the right support, this population of displaced persons is a resource. People who, will, who know something we don't know. They know the cost of deprivation, and they know the price of resilience. So today I'm going, to, I'm going to read you some testimony from people who could not be here. Three people who have been served by the Women's Refugee Commission. Stories of transformation through the voices of the displaced that uh, the Commission has served over the years. So the first, the first person I'd like you to meet is Zawadi. She's from Uganda, and her transformation was through non-formal education. My name is Zawadi. I am 16 years old. I was born in Congo. Both of my parents were killed during the conflict in my country. When I was eight years old, I ran away to Uganda with my grandmother. Now I live in a refugee camp. My family grows food on a small piece of land, and we get some extra food from the camp. I have never been to school. There's no money. I stayed at home all the time, so I never had a chance to make friends. I never met adults that I could learn from. But then I got lucky. I was one of 100 girls picked for the Women's Refugee Commission's Girls' Livelihood Project. Along with other girls from my camp, I joined the knitting and weaving class in the local knitting center. Now I make sweaters, stockings, head coverings, and shawls. I am more confident now because of the conversations I have with other girls and with the knitting project teacher. I am happy that this project was put in place for girls like me. I hope to knit sweaters for the schools and for the local market in our camp. Now I can make some money, and I can help my family. And even though I can't go to school, I will encourage other girls to attend school and complete their education. The 
The next is Elizabeth from Congo. My name is Elizabeth. I am 45 years old. There has been war in the Congo for half of my life. When soldiers occupied my village in North Kivu, my family ran into the bush. Rebels killed my husband. But I found a home for my four children and my grandchild at Nzulu, camp for internally displaced persons. Life in the camp was hard, often unsafe for women and girls. Every morning, I went into the forests outside the camp to collect firewood. There was no firewood around the camp anymore. So I had to walk deep into the forest. It was very dangerous. I hoped the park keepers who could rob my tools or the rebels who could attack me would not catch me. But I went because I had to feed my children. Thanks to the Women's Refugee Commission, a project started in many camps to keep women safe and to protect the environment. Families were given fuel-efficient stoves. I was one of the families that received a stove, and I learned how to use it. Now, I need to use less cooking fuel. We used to collect firewood six days a week. We had less time for other activities. Now we go to collect firewood only two times a week. The fuel-efficient stove I received made a big difference in my life. I now have more time for my work and to feed my children. And the last is Maria. My name is Maria. I am from Nicaragua. I came to the United States when I was 14 years old. When I was detained by immigration nearly 30 years later, at age 43, my son was at elementary school. He was not even 10 years old. I didn't have a chance to say goodbye to him or to explain where I was going. So I asked the arresting officer to let me make arrangements for someone to take care of my son. They did not let me. They put me in shackles and they took me away. I was so worried because I did not know what would happen to him. Eventually I learned that he was staying with different members of my family. But when they brought him to visit me, it was very hard. We were not allowed to touch. He was dirty. He did not look well cared for. And when my son came to visit me, he said, Mommy, you know what I miss? Your hugs. I told him, the next time I hug you, I will never let go. The Women's Refugee Commission came to visit me. From talking to women like me and hearing our stories, they have fought for many changes. They wrote a toolkit to help families fight for their rights so that children are not left alone without their parents to take care of them or hug them. The resilience of these refugee women and girls is what inspires us all. And I congratulate the bravery of the refugee women and children and their leaders for a quarter century of continuing effective on-the-ground advocacy because they have changed the lives of millions of people for the better. And it's now my great, great pleasure to introduce you to a young woman who at age 16 has such a strong global presence that she's known by one name, Malala. When the Taliban took, hold of, took control of her valley in Pakistan, Malala Yousafzai spoke out and she refused to be silenced. She fought for her right to an education. In 2012, she almost paid the ultimate price targeted by the Taliban, shot in the head while riding her school bus. 
very few people expected her to survive. However, her recovery has taken her on a journey from a remote area of Pakistan to addressing the United Nations General Assembly in New York on her 16th birthday. Today, Malala has become a global champion for the right of every child to an education. Malala is unable to be here in person today because she made a promise to herself and her family that she would never miss a day of school. But I am delighted to be able to introduce you to her virtually. And now, a person who is larger than life, she, Malala, will introduce our final Voices of Courage honoree by video from her home in England.